we're going to talk about deformity. So I have no industry conflicts. Um, I've got some specific learning objectives for you, and uh, we'll, the last slide will give you the answers to those. Uh, so this is my practice. This is the kind of thing that I do uh, relatively routinely, uh, thanks to uh, a number of other uh, opportunities for revision work uh, that can be challenging as well. I do adult deformity as well as pediatric deformity. Uh, and uh, this is an example of a case that presents the kind of challenge that I think navigation gives us an adjunct to help. So this is a, a GMFCS 5 CP child with a 140 degree curve. And that uh, you see on the lateral that you see an AP of the spine at the apex there. So the trajectory for the screw coming in at that level has, actually would have to go through the abdomen in order to get into the pedicle. Uh, the good news is attraction all the way down to what is that, 90 degrees. Um, and it's this kind of deformity that is a particular challenge. And so here's the intraoperative after we placed the screws. Uh, again, because of the angle of rotation, I couldn't put in the concave screws uh, on that, even with the patient in traction. Uh, and then we began the deformity correction, ripped out a few of the screws as we put incredible forces on them, did a partial VCR, uh, still didn't get it to move all the way back, but brought them around and took the 140 degree curve down to 68. Okay. Uh, and so this is the kind of case that I think uh, particularly demonstrates some of the values of navigation. So in spine deformity, this is the kind of expectation that we have today, that we get this kind of a result. And there's data to support that screws do a better job and they improve our ability to correct it. So why bother with navigation? Well, in deformity, we have altered anatomy. Uh, we have a lot of screws that we're putting in. Uh, the tolerance and the concavity of the spinal cord right up against the pedicle. I don't think we have the GERT spine two millimeter safe zone in some of those patients. So what is your tolerance for avoidable paraplegia in patients? Uh, for me, it's pretty darn uh, low. I, I'm not tolerant of that at all. The concave pedicles are deformed. Uh, we're applying tremendous intraoperative correction forces and that uh, we want the screws to be as optimal as possible. And so right now, and we'll get back to this, in 10 years since I've been using navigation, we got our O-arm in uh, October of 2006, uh, I've had a zero return to OR for implant malposition. I cannot say that for the 15 years that I operated before that. So, all right, so why do it? Well, so this is a case that was sent in to me from the community. All right, so straightforward degen spondy, routine kind of case. All right, so the L5 pedicles are a little bit medially convergent. And here's what the surgeon in the community did. Uh, and I think none of us really want this. That's not acceptable. And then in the thoracic spine, a little tougher. Uh, I don't know how well the thoracic aorta projects to you right there. It looks a little enlarged, and the screws are right next to it. Uh, again, another patient referred in to me. Uh, her BMI was high, and so it was tough. It's all the comments that everybody's been making. And there's lots of published cases of screws in places where we really don't want them to be. Uh, and sometimes they have rare catastrophic problems. Uh, so. We can, in fact, achieve this, and so the question is, what is it worth? Uh, so reviewing the pedicle morphology should be routine for everybody in this room. I like this uh, uh, Cote article looking at the, the, the cross-sections of it, showing that the medial wall is actually our friend. It's thicker than the lateral wall. But here's an example of a revision case. So this is a perfectly positioned screw through a revision fusion mass. This is a medially malpositioned screw, and this is a laterally malpositioned screw. I think very few of us have the tactile capability of discerning that difference intraoperatively. And so that sort of gives us the window of our performance envelope that we're now looking to regularly achieve. All right, and so this was just a study that we did a number of years ago where Larry Linke and I both started looking at the L1 pedicle on a plane film. If the L1 pedicle is small, you're gonna have a tough day. If the L1 pedicle is big, you're actually gonna have a good day. And the trivia question that I always ask my residents, what pedicle is bigger? T12 or L1, and everybody says, oh, we're taught the pedicles get bigger as you go from the top to the bottom. Well, that's not true at the thoracolumbar junction. L1 is actually 
smaller in 97% of the cases than T12. And then um, in deformity, we've learned over the years in multiple studies that we get this deformation of the pedicle with, with the abnormal growth of the spine. And that uh, Linke and, and Watanabe characterized this in an A, B, C, and D type of category where, you know, most of us without navigation can get an A pedicle. C pedicles are typically all cortical, and those are really kind of tough. And then the D pedicles, they probably really don't truly exist. And so when we look at the distribution of these, it's the AIS kids who have this problem, and it's especially in the concave vertebra. So the most difficult pedicles are where the spinal cord is plastered up against the pedicle and at the highest risk. So how good is good enough? Is 100% accuracy achievable? What's your acceptable rate of avoidable major complications? And what price are you willing to pay in terms of OR time and radiation exposure in order to avoid these? Well, so we've gone through and reviewed the literature fairly extensively. So if you want to search pedicle screws, you get a lot of results. Uh, and I think there is a bias in the literature. And so Larry Linke has written an awful lot of articles about pedicle screws and scoliosis. And so if Larry is better than the rest of the surgical population, and he's disproportionately represented, then we think that we're going to achieve better results than we're going to achieve. And I think that's true for a lot of literature where the experts get out and publish it first. And so there's a, a skew in the data set. So current uh, accuracy rates, there's some good meta-analyses that are out, and we'll walk through those. And what really got me started thinking about this was the Cosmopolis article, looking at the accuracy of navigation versus not navigation. And here is really the important slide. They looked at, by statistical analysis, what was minimum and maximum accuracy. So minimum accuracy in the thoracic spine, 27%. That's not very good, OK? Uh, and then we can go through and look in similar, more updated, recent analyses. You see similar kind of data where we're in the CT nav based systems are getting 95%, 97% uh, accuracy, and then comparing CT, 2D, 3D, fluoro. And then we also looked at it in kids. Uh, and in kids, I think there is somewhat of a linky effect that that uh, freehand literature suggests that we're probably that makes us think perhaps we're better than we are. Uh, and then this is some of Roger Hartle's group work looking at uh, screw perforation risk, and we see navigation improves the the probability that that won't happen. That especially that's true in the thoracic spine. It's true in the lumbar spine as well. And that overall operative time did not increase based on the literature. Uh, and blood loss was actually a tiny bit less. Uh, so here's what I take from the literature. If you put in 11 pedicle screws, navigation should avoid one screw malposition. All right, and then uh, uh, the comparison of fluoro freehand and fluoro guided, and that freehand techniques, you tend to have more medial malposition screws, whereas with navigation, I think you get more lateral perforations probably due to the thickness of the uh, uh, medial wall. Uh, but with freehand, the violations tend to be more medial, and I think those tend to be more problematic, at least in deformity. Uh, other, other data based in all regions. And the thoracic spine is really, I think, our biggest challenge. And then there's a great study out of CHOP. Some of them were believer, Children's Hospital of, uh, of uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and that some of the surgeons there said, oh, I'm going to use navigation. And some of them said, I'm not going to use navigation. They were all doing similar AIS kind of cases. And they all did check spins after they put their screws in. So those who navigated repositioned or removed 0.6%. And those who didn't repositioned or removed 4.9% of their screws. Um, uh, so it's it's there have been multiple studies and meta-analyses demonstrating that for navigation, it's going to give us better uh, placement. There's at least now one study meta-analysis suggesting it may take a little bit longer. I think the other thing that's important to talk about are potential sources of error. And there is one paper that sort of talks somewhat about this, but this is really an experience base of a decade of use in, in my experience. Uh, and I think frame bang or reference arc dislodgement is the most common reason for navigation error. And that uh, we've 
demonstrated that or proven it to ourselves a number of times. I think we've heard the comment about intersegmental motion, especially in the cervical spine or in fracture dislo unstable fracture dislocations. You can't use the reference frame below a fracture to navigate screws above a fracture and expect it to be accurate. Um, uh, instrument, so it's changed my workflow. I used to go in and do my facetectomies and my releases before I placed my screws. Now I don't want to destabilize the spine, so I'll place the screws and then do my uh, osteotomies to loosen things up. Uh, instrumentation deformation, we've done that, especially in iliac screw placement, uh, driving an awl across and deforming the shape of the awl, pulling out and going, hmm, that's not good. Uh, and system errors, we've all, we always blame the system first, and rarely does that come out to be that that's what it is. And that if you don't, if something doesn't look right, then you've got to check and, and just put the pointer on a, uh, a known point like the spinous process and see, are you close or not? Uh, and that that's really important and that I play a game with my residents. Find the starting point and the trajectory without using the navigation. Now, use the navigation to confirm, are you close or not? Uh, so we've looked at the comparison between the virtual versus actual um, accuracy of our screws. Uh, we put our screws in and then spun them afterwards and looked at the angular alignments. And uh, in about uh, 240 screws, we found about a 2% variation in the virtual versus the actual placement. Uh, and this is what does a 2% variation look like? So you see that intersegmental bar there? Uh, that's a 2% variation. And then we looked at uh, uh, 5, 10, and uh, bigger degrees of variation. And in a big lumbar pedicle, not a big deal. In a thoracic pedicle, 2% variation may actually be significant. Uh, but that gives us a sense of what that means. So what about robots? And we're going to hear more about this. And to date, the, the meta-analysis literature on it suggests that there is not an advantage of robots currently over uh, conventional navigation. I think that's going to probably change over time. But today, that's what the meta-analysis shows us, uh, and that uh, it doesn't show a particular advantage. Is there a learning curve? We've heard a little bit about this, and yes, there is. So let's talk about learning curves for a minute. So learning curves and pedicle screws, it looks like the data suggests that about 80 screws, you start to see uh, improvement in performance of either trainees or uh, other surgeons, and that their performance accuracy approaches that of senior uh, surgeons, uh, and that uh, they, they go from you know maybe 85% to about 95%. Uh, but that, those were in non-deformity cases. And then Barry Lahner has shown us his learning curve uh, in uh, deformity cases where we do see that there is still a learning curve that improves over time, both the time and the accuracy of the screw placement and the curve overall correction as well. Another group of uh, experienced and non-experienced surgeons doing similar cases look to compare how does it look. And so they define these three categories of less than 20, 20 to 50, and greater than 50 cases. And they all use the same technique. They were all doing freehand and neuromonitoring. And what they found was that the more experienced group uh, had uh, the, the breach rate was similar, but the more experienced group had fewer medial breaches than the novice group. Uh, the next question is, what about palpation of the screw track? Uh, so we studied this many years ago at Walter Reed. And everybody says, oh, you just feel and see if, it's in, uh, if there's a hole or not. And so we wanted to see, is that reliable? Is palpation reliable? And so we did a cadaveric study. Uh, and uh, this is a summary. And the top number was me. And then there was a chief resident, a mid-level resident, and an intern. And so it was experience dependent about your ability to palpate a, a, a pedicle screw breach. And then uh, another group of um, uh, a fellowship, all fellowship trained surgeons said, oh, we don't think that's right. And so they redid the study. And what did they find? They found it wasn't as reliable as they thought. Uh, so our ability to discern breaches is not 100% at all. And then this is a clinical series by Ross Moquin out of Rochester, New York. And it's, um, it's not comforting at all that the overall accuracy for palpation was only 48%. And this is a case from that series. And I don't think any of us would find that clinically acceptable. So my personal experience with pedicle screws began with uh, freehand screw placement in 1992. Um, 
In 93, we started routinely getting post-operative CT scans. Uh, I moved to Minnesota in 2003, and in 2006 got uh, the O-arm and stealth. Uh, and so we looked at our initial work uh, back in the early days of thoracic pedicle screws, and we defined accuracy versus acceptability, so we weren't concerned with a lateral breach uh, up against the rib heads. Uh, and our accuracy rates were uh, okay. Uh, and here are my two worst screws from those cases uh, in the early days. The first one was a Shoreman's patient and uh, didn't need revision. The other one was an AIS patient. It was proximally aorta. I couldn't sleep at night, so I revised that one. Uh, we compared it to with and without deformity. And the, the thing that we showed, we couldn't show that we missed more screws in deformity, but we could show that our highest miss rate was T5 to T8. Uh, and that's where the pedicles are smallest. So updated series with navigation, uh, 2,500 screws. So a 2.5% intraoperative reposition rate. Again, you're there. You don't like the screw. It could be bigger. It could be longer. It could be better position. But again, that T6 to T8 range, and no difference in children and adults in this regard, although we did have a slightly higher reposition rate in pediatric cases compared to adult cases. Uh, but when we compared our rate to the literature base, um, we were better than them. And here what I want you to take away is once you get below four millimeters, your rate of revision of screws gets much higher. Uh, return to OR, zero in now 10 years. And the literature would suggest somewhere between a 1% and 4% rate. Congenital scoliosis, it's tougher. 19% of the time, we couldn't put screws in because there weren't any pedicles. And then we've looked at perk screws as well. And our perk screw uh, initial series, one screw out of 166 needed to be repositioned, but no returns to the OR. And that's what a meta-analysis of perk screw positioning rates look like. We have, we've heard about radiation concerns. Uh, and so my conclusions are that navigation does result in more accurate screw placement. Not clear that it takes longer. I don't think that it does in my hands. Um, blood loss, I'm not sure we can argue for that. Uh, or complication rates, a harder piece. We've heard about the capital imp uh, investment piece, and there is increased radiation exposure to the patient, but decrease to the surgical team. So 0% return to OR. I'm about three to six minutes per screw, including the nav spin and the check spin. Um, it's allowed us to do very difficult things with high reliability. And so here are the take-home points uh, for the learning objectives. T5 to T8, toughest area in the thoracolumbar spine for hitting screws. Uh, T12 is reliably bigger than L1, and there are a lot of sources for potential error, and that my personal opinion is that intersegmental motion and reference frame disruption are the major ones. Thank you very much.